when your grandchildren ask you, what did you do for freedom? You'll be able to say you were at the National Gallery and you walked through the kitchen <laughs> to come to dinner to celebrate 70 years of the IPA. My name is John Roskam. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs. As our Chairman said, apologies for those of you who may have been held up by those who weren't so keen for us to exercise our freedom of speech. I'm sure I saw Steve Conroy and Nicola Roxon in that group somewhere. <laughs> I'd like to begin by reading out the text of a half-page newspaper advertisement from the IPA. We took out the, the advertisement to publicise our economic policy research and to point out the problem with the federal government's policies. I quote from the advertisement, let us stop reckless government spending and reckless taxation to support reckless spending. Let us keep government out of meddling. Let's make both employers and employees equally responsible under the law. <laughs> Down the bottom of the advertisement, we said, funds are needed for this campaign. Donations will gratefully be received. That advertisement was from page four of the Sydney Morning Herald from the 15th of October, 1947. Some things don't change. We fought for freedom then and we fight for freedom now. We needed money then and we need money now too. 64 years later, almost to the day on the 5th of October 2011, the IPA took out a full page advertisement in the Australian newspaper, which said the following, freedom of speech is fundamental to a free society. The Andrew Bolt case shows freedom of speech is under threat. It is alarming that in 2011, someone can be taken to court for expressing an opinion. The IPA ran an appeal to raise money for the advertisement and 1,261 people donated. Rupert, I'm sure that the only reason the IPA took out an ad in the Sydney Morning Herald was that in 1947 the Australian newspaper did not exist. I recognise the many sacrifices that IPA members have come to make to be with us tonight. This dinner is a fundraising event, unlike the mining tax. <laughs> I would also like to welcome those people who the Chairman acknowledged, particularly two IPA members, two long-serving IPA members, the Premier, and the Federal Leader of the Opposition. In addition, I would like to acknowledge some special guests. Imans Kins, the co-chairman of Australians for Northern Development and Economic Vision. Robert Thompson, the chief executive of News Corporation. Kim Williams, the chief executive of News Limited. Two great professors who need no introduction, Professor Ian Plymer and Professor Bob Carter are with us tonight. <laughs> there are some special friends of the IPA, Ron Manners, the chair of the Mancal Economic Education Foundation in Perth, Tom Switzer, 
the editor of Spectator Australia, Keith Winshuttle, the editor of Quadrant, Anthony Capello, the publisher of Connor Court. I would also like to acknowledge the members of the Federal Parliament who are with us tonight. From the House of Representatives, Bruce Bilson, Bronwyn Bishop, Greg Hunt, Sophie Mirabella, Scott Morrison, Kelly O'Dwyer, Christopher Pine, Andrew Robb, and Dan Tian. I would like to welcome the senators who are with us tonight. Corey Bernardi, George Brandis, Mitch Fifield, Helen Kroger, Scott Ryan, and Dean Smith. I would like to welcome from the Victorian Parliament also Murray Thompson, and from the Tasmanian Parliament, Adam Brooks. To the members of Parliament who are here tonight, we welcome and appreciate your willingness to listen to the ideas of the IPA. We won't always agree. At times, the IPA may be critical of some of the policies of political parties, but the most important thing is that there is debate and discussion. It is the IPA's role to push policy boundaries and embrace radical ideas. After all, it was the great Alan Wood in the Australian newspaper in May 2009 when he was surveying the popular and policy attitudes of the ETS who wrote, none has gone so far as the IPA in calling for the ETS to be scrapped. The IPA exists only because of our donors and our supporters. There are some very special supporters here tonight and I'd like to acknowledge them. Walter and Crystal Cummins, Hanif Kasim, Richard Stackpool, Harold Den Hartog, Rosalind Cogan and David Schaefer, Andy Kennard, George Binley, Ian Mentz, Stuart Wood, Amanda Turner, Graham Miller, Mark Rayner, Ewan Tyler, Richard Morgan, Christopher Game, Peter Hansen, Catherine Forrest and Ian Patterson, Peter O'Brien and Paul Thomas. <laughs> I now have some apologies. There's two main ones. One from Kevin Rudd. <laughs> Simon Crean bought him a ticket, but at the last minute, Kevin decided not to come. <laughs> and Tim Flannery, who, after he heard might be sacked by Tony Abbott, decided to stay overnight in Canberra and clean out his desk. <laughs> the Institute of Public Affairs is not a big organisation. We use our limited resources to have a big impact on public debate and public policy. We have a wonderful team of less than 20 staff. The path we follow was laid down by C.D. Kemp, our founding executive director. It's been followed by the other executive directors here tonight, Rod Kemp, our chairman, John Hyde, Mike Nahan, and now myself. Thanks to your support, the IPA is growing fast. In the last 12 months, the IPA's membership has doubled. In the last five years, our membership has grown 500%. Thanks to our generous supporters and donors, our revenue last year was $4 million through 3,945 separate donations. Last year, we were able to make a small surplus which is better than the federal government does. 
This support has allowed us to have a big impact. Last year, IPA staff appeared on television 159 times. They gave 446 radio interviews. We were mentioned in news stories 754 times. On average, IPA staff appear somewhere in Australia at least four times a year. We published 20 reports. We made five submissions to government inquiries. We held 34 public events around the country, including with the great Mark Stein. We have used the platform members and donors have given us to shift the debate. In the light of events a bit earlier this evening, I think it's important to reflect on the victory we have all had for freedom of speech in Australia. Let me just take a moment to reflect on the IPA's role in defeating the law that would have made it unlawful to offend someone on the basis of their political opinion. The day after the then Attorney General released the draft bill, IPA researchers studied the bill, examined the bill, and Simon Breeny, the head of our Legal Rights Project, identified exactly the dangers of the law. The next day, the IPA used our research and I wrote to every single federal member of parliament to tell them what this law would do. The very first newspaper article explaining the law was by Simon in the Australian newspaper. It took three weeks for others to follow the IPA's lead. As you know, subsequently, the legislation was withdrawn. The IPA has been proud to lead the debate and be part of the debate on media regulation, and I think it's important to acknowledge the role again of News Limited, of Rupert Murdoch, Kim Williams and others in stopping a bad, dangerous law. <laughs> Last year, a human rights academic at an Australian university wrote, the Institute of Public Affairs has been one of the loudest advocates of free speech arguments against media regulation. I don't think she meant it as a compliment but we'll take it. You'll hear more about the work of the IPA tonight. Thank you for your support.